Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome you here today to the JIS webinar um, that's going to focus on advancing the use of long-acting HIV treatment and prevention regimens. My name is Kenneth Mayer. I'm Medical Research Director at Fenway Health in Boston and a professor at Harvard University. And I'm joined by my co-editor-in-chief of the Journal of the International AIDS Society, Dr. Annette Son, uh, who is the director of the Treat Asia Initiative and Vice President of the American Foundation, excuse me, the Association for uh, AIDS Research. Uh, we're very happy uh, to welcome you to this webinar. Uh, the rationale for the webinar is that one of the most exciting developments in recent years uh, regarding HIV treatment and prevention uh, is the advent of long-acting medication. Long-acting medication offers great promise, but there also are many challenges. And we're really excited today to have a panel that will be able to discuss these issues in, in great length. Uh, this webinar today is based on a special issue of the Journal of the International AIDS Society that was published last summer in conjunction with the um, International AIDS Conference. Um, this uh, special um, issue was uh, led by co-editors, Dr. Charles Flexner of Johns Hopkins University, uh, Dr. Sinead uh, delaney Moretley of um, WITS um, in Johannesburg, South Africa, and Dr. Jose Bauermeister of the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, the uh, publication uh, was um, supported by uh, colleagues uh, from the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases and the National Institutes of Mental Health, and for that we are very appreciative. Uh, and at this point, I would like to um, welcome uh, Drs. Uh, delaney Moretley and Dr. Flexner to be able to um, share with you um, uh, um, a sense of what uh, was in the supplement and our run of show. So without further ado, uh, Charlie and um, Sinead, please take it away. Thanks, Ken. Uh, I am Charlie Flexner from uh, Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, professor of medicine, pharmacology, and international health. Um, and uh, I'm going to be giving an overview of the supplement and then I will turn it over to Sinead, who will discuss today's agenda and introduce our speakers. So uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge uh, the fact that this supplement was really the brainchild of Tia Morton at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases in Bethesda, Maryland, um, and Terry Sin at the National Institute of Mental Health. And they nominated uh, myself, Sinead, and Jose to be co-editors. Um, our responsibility was to review the 45 proposals, select the 16 finalists, and uh, help to edit uh, those uh, uh, submissions for publication. Um, for this special issue, we invited scholars to submit multidisciplinary articles designed to advance the development, future use, and equitable delivery of long-acting and extended uh, release drug regimens for HIV prevention and treatment. As I said, we received 45 abstracts spanning original research, commentaries, reviews, and viewpoints. After careful deliberation, the editorial team selected 16 finalists that illustrate current uh, uh, long-acting uh, advances and challenges to improve the development, retention, and equitable delivery of these formulations across low, middle, and high-income countries. There were three overriding themes for this supplement, and those included understanding end user needs, desires, and contexts to improve uh, long-acting formulation development and testing. Secondly, multi-level initiatives are needed to address barriers to uh, long-acting uh, uh, formulation access. And finally, discussing a way forward and uh, um, identifying research priorities and key populations who should be targeted for these kinds of interventions. Um, overall, there were 117 authors in this supplement representing 12 different countries. Cumulatively, the uh, PDFs of these articles uh, have been downloaded um, uh, over 17,400 times from the launch date of July 13th, 2023 that's only seven months, which I think, which I think illustrates the uh, great uh, interest and attention being paid uh, to these kinds of interventions. With that, I would now like to turn the podium over to my colleague, Sinead Delaney uh, Moretli from uh, South Africa, 
who will discuss today's agenda and introduce our speakers. Sinead. Thanks very much, Charlie. Uh, just to say, it has been an enormous privilege to work on this uh, supplement, and I'm delighted that we're able to have four great speakers to speak on some of the key themes that um, Charlie just highlighted. So the first speaker will be Gazina Mayer Rath, uh, who will who was one of the supplement authors from South Africa, and she'll talk about facilitating access to long acting regimens. Then we'll have Kenneth Nguri from Kenya, who was an author, in fact, on two of the articles in the supplement, and he'll talk on the delivery aspects of long acting regimens and what we need to think of. Uh, Ariane van der Straten was also an author on a systematic review, and she is going to reflect a little bit on what we need to consider in, when we think about choice with respect to long acting regimens. And then we'll wrap up the speakers uh, with uh, Peter Kim and Diane Rausch, who are going to talk to us about considerations for future research priorities for uh, long acting extended uh, delivery agents. Um, after that, all of these sessions are pre recorded, so we will uh, hear them uh, one after the other. We're also very fortunate to have two testimonials, which uh, will bring to us, I think, a really important perspective, which is the perspective of end users and people in communities, uh, and really remind us that these agents uh, are life changing for, for many people uh, in parts of the world that have been impacted by HIV. Uh, once we have had all the presentations, we will then move to a live panel discussion and a Q&A session, uh, which will be chaired by uh, Beatrice Greenstein and all of the, the presenters um, uh, will, will have an opportunity to have a live discussion. And, and hopefully then we'll be able to wrap up at the end uh, and Annette will close us out. Uh, so I think with that as the run of show, what we can do is go straight into the first uh, video. Hi, I would like to stay anonymous. I'd like to speak about the, the, the injection when I first got it. When I first heard about the injection, um, I was curious and scared at the same time. Hence, I've never gotten an injection in my bums before. But when I, um, when I got it the first time, it was scary. Hence, we, to a point where I even str the, the, the doctors even struggled to even get the muscle in, in my bum. But then... Finally, I got, in, I got comfortable and used to it. Um, with the injection, I kind of feel like it's, it's, it would play a huge role in our lives as people because we won't get to use um, the tablets anymore. Um, and it's, the, with the, it's got many positive um, um, aspects to it. So with that being said, um, with the injection, I feel like a lot of people would need it and would be able to use it because um, the, the thing of drinking tablets each and every day, it's tiring. It's very tiring to the point whereby you would feel like you're not, you, you, you want to default. But with the, with the injection, it's kind of different, very different to the point whereby when you, actually it's not that different, but somehow different because when you get injected, um, it does, it does hurt. It's very hurtful, guys. I know I won't lie, but it's kind of it, it's great for it. It helps with the, um, with the the with the what you call, the the your health. It helps with your health. It helps with you um, not carrying tablets whenever you have to go to sleepovers. Um, I would say for the injection for me, it was nice. I should say, even though at first it was very scary, but it was nice. Um, other than that, um, I feel great and I would love for the injection to carry on for the many years to come um, so, that the, so that people could stop using tablets, hence it's tiring using tablets. Um, also, I'd like to say that the only negative side about it, it's just the pain, just the pain, but other than that, everything is cool.
Hello, I'm Gesine Meyerath from the Health Economics and Epidemiology Research Office at the University of the Witwatersrand in South Africa. I'm presenting on behalf of my colleague Lisa Jamieson and me um, our work on facilitating access to long acting regimens, in particular to cabotegavir um, as an injectable PrEP option. We'll talk about the supply and demand side considerations that played a role in our work with the South African Department of Health in advising them on their Kabale rollout. So firstly, a quick look at the current state of the Kabale regulatory approvals from about two weeks ago. Currently, and this is focused on Africa, currently um, we have approvals in South Africa, but also five different African countries. Um, a very quick um, experience was shared from by colleagues from Zimbabwe. This is very good reading for anyone who's interested in how to fast forward their own re regulatory approval. Um, and this now lands us in a situation where we have approval in these countries around the world. Um, these are also countries where no formal regulatory process is in place. And those will be soon joined by a whole number of other countries, again, quite a number of countries in Africa um, that will, where um, the process is currently underway. And then at the maximum, these are all the countries where the medicines patent pool um, deal applies. So low and middle income countries, or in particular low middle income countries and low income countries around the world, as well as a number of countries with high HIV prevalence. So basically, just quickly, if you focus again on Southern Africa, you see that between these two blocks, um, most of Southern Africa will have access in the next coming months, um, is the hope, um, to injectable cabotegavir. Um, could Kabale as PrEP be the game changer that we need it to be? Now, from our modeling in South Africa, we know that its effectiveness is higher than that of medical male circumcision or condoms or perfectly adhere to, adhere to ART. It is the most single most effective intervention that in seven years of modeling uh, interventions as part of the South African HIV investment case, um, we've, we've not seen anything as effective as this. So across different assumptions of um, CAB um, LA uh, duration, effective, um, effective use and duration, we see that it could prevent between 15 and 28 percent of HIV acquisitions in South Africa over the next 20 years. And we've never, as I said, seen anything like it. This is on top of an already existing at baseline, an existing HIV program in which most prevention interventions are already routinely offered and where we've already met the first and the third of the 1990-90 targets. Now, we know that in about three or four years time, we will have through the MPP deal, voluntary licenses to, to, um, to three separate generic manufacturers. From there on out, if laws of market um, um, hold, we will have a gigantic reduction in the price of this product. But what are we doing until then? We don't have three years to wait. So right now we have this huge difference in prices per injection between um, about $6,500 per injection and $3,800 in the US and the UK, respectively, on the one hand side. And the cost that the manufacturer has offered to um, low and middle income countries of between $40 and $45 per injection. Chai has done an analysis that, um, that most of us will be aware of that um, where they showed that the cost of manufacture itself, so not the price, but the cost should be between two and three dollars, including capital expenditure, which of course this current manufacturer has already um, um, paid for. In South Africa, we've seen in our modeling that we oughtn't be paying more than nine to fifteen dollars per injection for Kabale to be as cost effective as oral prep. So it's a simple cost effectiveness analysis um, turned on its head to come at, uh, out with a threshold price. Now this threshold price was used by the South African government in um, in uh, dis discussing and and um, negotiating this price with the manufacturer, um, who then responded by saying this threshold price of $9 to $15 per injection significantly underestimates the cost of manufacture, which is more expensive and much harder than for generic oral prep, which is a simple white tablet, just in case anyone forgot, instead, of course, then uh, of a 
with sterile injection. So if this were, oh, and then proceeded to offer um, injectable cabotegravir to the South African government at the upper limit of this price range that they had decided on about a year ago, and that's $45 per injection. Now, if this currently offered price is in fact the same as the cost of production and we cannot reduce it, that needs one of two things optimally too at the same time. We either need a buy-down by a donor to reduce the cost to a level acceptable to um, low- and middle-income country governments, including the South African government, or we need a commitment by one of those governments um, to fund a large enough KLA rollout program, which would then drive down just by sheer force of volumes um, and economies of scale to drive down the cost of KLA for the rest of the world. Now, those two things sound very nice and somewhat theoretical until we remember that both of them have already happened in the past for other products. The buy-down was very effectively used by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for HIV self-test kits that were offered at a dollar, I think, per kit until a large enough market in um, high prevalence countries was established. And the same happened um, where the South African government stepped in and committed to very large rollouts of TB expert cartridges and did the same again for HIV viral load tests. So in both cases, reducing the cost of those two commodities for the rest of the world. But South Africa cannot do this at this present moment. Our um, fiscal space is severely depleted, just like in a number of other countries after COVID-19, which where we didn't only have very severe lockdowns with a huge impact on the economy, but also um, gigantic losses of life. So right now, we also know that the that Cavalier itself will add quite a lot to the cost of the South African HIV um, um, program. We're at baseline line, it's over here in dark red. We can expand it quite a bit under what's currently a flatline budget um, going down from the year before. We don't see it here um, for the first time. But a flatline budget, we can expand a little bit of testing and treatment in order to then also roll out Cabal A, we would have to have up to 40% more budget, which we currently don't have. So the third option here is then to reduce the cost of production. As we know, currently it's produced by a single manufacturer. It's basically a monopoly um, situation. So over the next three years before we have that pressure of the generic production coming in, that might be one of the few things that we can still affect. But it will be up to the monopolist. We also want to um, build this huge um, um, uh, program, which would allow us just by force of volume to reduce cost further, just because the total um, profit to be made out of a large volume at a low price is the same as having a high price at a very low volume. It's also imp important in order for us to have that impact that we modeled at the beginning, that huge impact on um, HIV infections. For this, we need all these five steps more or less at the same time. We need rapid regulatory approval. That's way underway. Um, WHO's pre-qualification. We have to integrate KBLA into national guidelines. Of course, none of us are in a position to dictate those guidelines, but where appropriate. Um, we need to have it included into the PEPFA and Global Fund drug lists. And we need to work on manufacturing capacity um, at the moment, but also into the future, especially also local manufacturer, and that can be full and finished. We don't need additional licenses for that in order to bring the product as close as possible to the markets where it matters most. We also have to then work with countries to um, have supply chains in, in place at the very moment when we start rolling out Cavalier. We also have to guarantee that by the moment it's available, there is enough demand for it. And that, of course, for that, we are looking to oral prep, and this the picture there is not very promising. This is the world map of um, uh, AL, uh, prep initiations from August last year. It hasn't really changed very much. As you can see, the darkest country here is South Africa. Uh, black over here is China, where we have no data, and that is because out of about five million PEP initiations globally, about a million, so 18% have happened in South Africa. However, we also know from our data in South Africa that most people who've ever started oral PEP have since abandoned it. 
we need, therefore, the injectable PrEP program, the Kabbalah program, to be intentionally designed to be completely different from the oral PrEP uh, program from the beginning. We know that there's strong demand for an injectable over PrEP, oral PrEP, but that's mostly in people who've either tried oral PrEP or have considered it. For Kabbalah to be yielding those large volumes that we need. We need to start thinking about targeting additional population groups, for example, heterosexual men, ever thought about them. Um, they're from surveys in South Africa, we know that they are quite interested in PrEP, especially also because no one's ever stopped to talk to them about PrEP. We also want to kind of target anyone with a negative HIV test. Always the majority at the moment in South Africa, we have about 3% HIV uh, uh, test positivity across different um, testing modalities, which means that out of any mo testing modality, we have 97% who are HIV negative and who should in the future leave with a, um, uh, with a conversation that, that has been had um, with them about um, uh, prevention op options that include injectable PrEP. We need any Kabbalah rollout to be community-based and peer-led where possible. So it needs to be at the primary healthcare level by the low staff cadres, possibly using deltoid rather than gluteal injections to make it easier for, um, for uh, lower cadre staff and extend the dosing interval. And of course, we have to use non-traditional outlets, not only those but, um, very famous uh, key population-run clinics and um, outlets, really. Um, in Thailand, but also private pharmacies, doctors, practices, etc. So in summary, Kabbalah can act as an example of how to set up a successful prevention intervention. It is the first out of the pipeline of a, of a number of prevention interventions, but it also will be the only one for the next couple of years, which gives us time to, um, to scale this up, but makes it also very urgent. We need to scale up rapidly now to create a big enough market for Kabbalah both for prices to be lowered, but also for those large impacts to be realized. And the rapid scale up requires all these steps more or less as at the same time um, that I've mentioned before. Thank you very much. Greetings, my name is Kenneth Ngura from Jomo Kenyatta University, Nairobi, Kenya, and I would like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to discuss this important topic of delivery of long-acting extended delivery regimens. This is quite timely, and this kind of discussions may help avoid some of the pitfalls we've encountered when delivering oral prep and ART. This is the outline of my presentation. As a way of introduction, I would like to remind us that we, there are approximately 28 million people accessing treatment and that there were more than a million new HIV infections in 2022. And I believe sadly that the picture is the same in 2023. The current daily oral regimens for prevention and treatment face multiple challenges, especially related to adherence, frequent uh, clinic visits and stigma, especially when delivering in HIV clinics. And this is what we have also seen when delivering PrEP in HIV clinics. We have seen challenges related to stigma, limited hours of operation, long wait times and travel distance, and lack of privacy because of the high numbers. And this picture is applicable also to HIV treatment. For long-acting extended delivery products to impact prevention and treatment maximally, we need to take advantage of the lessons learned in almost a decade of delivery of oral PrEP and longer for ART. I will structure the lessons learned on the building blocks of differentiated service delivery for treatment and prevention, specifically when which relates, relates to service type, what which describes the various models of delivery, where which relates to service location, and whom mainly relates to health worker CADA. I will start by discussing the demand creation and what we have seen with demand creation, with community input and um, positive gain framing messages about the benefits of PrEP in terms of empowerment and greater intimacy and working with users and providers as PrEP champions to increase knowledge and motivation have been effective ways to create demand. And this could be considered for delivery of long-acting products. 
another interesting lesson has been body mouth dispensing, which became very popular during the height of COVID pandemic and reduced clinic visits and improved persistence. And, and, and uh, many facilities have continued with this model post COVID where stable clients can choose this model. When thinking about uh, product, uh, delivering long active products, I think more around the dapivirid vaginal ring and other products in the pipeline that could be self-administered that could end users could use them on their own. And it's something that they could end up getting multiple doses. But for cabelling, the current formulation requires health provider assistance. Multiple studies have also demonstrated that HIV self-testing is highly acceptable and can increase the number of people on prevention and treatment. Our recent GPMG prep trial demonstrated that HIV self-testing reduced the clinic visits by half without compromising adherence, testing, and retention. Women not in several different relationships even had better adherence while on the HIV self-testing arm. Dr. Brain, through HIV self-testing may not Though HIV self-testing may not be used for all long-acting products, I can foresee, for example, a woman getting several rings and HIV self-test kits and using this comfortably at home. I believe I'm preaching to the choir when I say that providers play a key role in the current delivery of ALT and PrEP, and multiple studies, including in-depth interviews with providers, have supported that training providers translates to higher uptake and persistence. Therefore, a good starting point for delivery of long-acting products would be to train and support providers. Integration of oral prep into HIV clinics, especially for those in HIV cell or different relationship, delivering uh, these uh, products in maternal and child health clinics, family planning clinic, post abortion clinic, STI, and also integrating in gender-affirming services for transgender women translated in better results than stand-alone or serial delivery. Therefore, integration should be considered when thinking about long-acting delivery products and looking at lessons learned. For example, when delivering oral prep in family planning, we didn't see higher continuation, but probably that also provides an opportunity to explore the reasons why and provide more support. Adherence and persistence to the current ALT and oral prep has also been challenging for some populations, especially young women. For oral prep, support has included individual strategies such as support club, SMS reminders, which have yielded mixed re results, peer support. But most importantly, what we have learned, rather than providing one size fit all for adherence support, providing a menu where users can choose the methods that work best for them is has been quite beneficial. More recently, Dr. Monica Gatti and colleagues has uh, have, have demonstrated that point of care tenography urine test to support current centered cancering has been highly acceptable and has increased adherence for both ART and PrEP. Appropriate reminders for those on on the ring and car bearing will need to be identified, but we do not need to reinvent the wheel. There are already some reminders that are working very well in the field of family planning and should be considered as a starting point. More recently, a study that I was involved in um, taught us that um, offering a safe space for users to try different products and then choose the product that works best led to higher high adherence among young women aged 16 to 21 and this high adherence was reported for both ring and oral prep which was higher than previously reported in other studies and after using the two products for six months each two thirds of them chose the ring private pharmacies are ubiquitous in many regions of the world and serve a specific clientele that varies convenience and does not mind paying for it when we piloted PrEP delivery in pharmacies, we were able to see high initiation and continuation and were able to reach higher risk populations and even more men than fixed facility models. Therefore, pharmacies could be an additional service location for long-acting products. And importantly, when we recently did a stakeholder consultation on delivering Carberry in pharmacies, the stake various stakeholders told us that Carberry could be delivered in pharmacies as long as providers are trained and also, if not, then we could start with pharmacies that have 
nurses and doctors. Peers influence behaviors and have the potential to increase PrEP uptake and continuation among young women and could distribute HIV self-testing as a gateway for prevention and treatment. Similarly, telehealth and mobile vans and courier delivery, and some of the couriers could be providers have become that became very popular during the COVID pandemic could also be evaluated for delivery of long acting products. Task shifting, on the other hand, um, have shown us that where, for example, we have nurses do routine delivery to free time for doctors to handle complex cases, have led to higher uptake and continuation, and some facilities have successfully piloted follow up clients going to pharmacy directly for refills. And most of these visits have yielded great results. Also, we have seen that um, some of the visits where they are attached to a specific provider so that one provider completes all the aspects of the visits have also been quite successful. And these lessons could greatly inform delivery of long-acting long products. So as I come to a close, I would like to restate that delivery of oral prep and LRT has demonstrated, has demonstrated innovative ways to overcome user, provider, and health system barriers that can be leveraged when delivering long-acting products. However, some of these recently introduced products such as Cabele may need special considerations, especially those related to HIV testing type of providers to deliver these services and code chain requirements. And that the new long-acting products in the pipeline, if efficiently delivered, will offer the much needed choice in HIV prevention and treatment, which could translate to higher uptake and um, impact the HIV pandemic. I would like to thank the participants and the staff of the multiple studies cited. I would also want to thank the funders for providing the funds. Otherwise, we would not have been able to conduct this important work. Thank you. My name is Asake Kanya. I stay at Samara Michelle. Uh, I'm using a day at uh, KTC. The injection have done a good impact on me in a way that I was too tired to take Elandu's take medication every day because I was using pills, but I had to because it, it is about my life. But now that we have an injection that the Desmond Tutu has that Desmond to have, it helps us in a way that I don't have to take pills every day. We just come to the clinic and have an injection and you stay for two months and then you come again. But in medication, in pills, you have to take them every day. Even if you come to the clinic and take them, you have to take them every day at home. Even if you are not at home, you have to rush back home to take the pills. But in injection, you don't have to worry about anything because you just injection once, then you stay for two months, then you come back again. So I would like, it would be better if all the South African people that are HIV positive to have the injection because it will help them to not default. And even the older people, they are tired of taking the pills, but the, the injection has not reached their age yet. They're still, still looking at the younger people. So I think that the injection is very good. And I think that if, if it continues, I would like to be part of it. Thank you. Hello. My name is Ariane van der Straten. Thank you for the opportunity to present on choice of long acting and extended delivery regimens for prevention. I would like to start with a quote from a 2022 editorial on PrEP choice. As humans, we come in many different shapes and forms. Options for HIV prevention need to match this variation. So with that in mind, here is a snapshot of the current PrEP landscape. And what you can see is that both long acting methods that are highlighted in green here and ultra long acting methods highlighted in violet and that I define at 
has six plus months of duration are the majority of new PrEP options in the, in the pipeline. So there are no benefits in developing more options if they are not liked or used. So an important reminder is to keep a user in mind when doing product development. And that's what the Matrix project depicted here um, and which is funded by PEPFAR and USAID is doing. Um, it's um, focusing on nine early R&D products, including two event-driven, three long-acting, and four ultra-long-acting products. And intentionally, these are informed by end users from the preclinical stage onwards. And the hope is that by incorporating user preference early on, modifiable attributes can be optimized and products may have a greater chance of future success. So why focus on choice? Well, our premise is that more acceptable option we lead to better choice, increased coverage, and higher health impact. And before diving more into the choice process, I would like to share a great definition of choice, which was published by Katie Williams from FHAI 360 last year. Choice means that individuals have the autonomy, knowledge, and freedom from coercion at any given time to select the best method for them among options available. So we have much to learn about that from the contraceptive field. And what you can see on the left is a graph that comes from a systematic review which assessed the impact of increasing contraceptive choice globally. And what was found is that increased choice for contraceptives was associated with increased uptake, more persistent use and better health outcomes. So on the PrEP side of things, let's see what we can anticipate. And Kutisa and colleagues conducted a discrete choice experiment among fishing communities in Uganda. And they modeled PrEP coverage in women and in men. And what they found is that the proportion with no protection, which is highlighted in green in this bar graph, uh, will decrease as more options are available. However, multiple options will be needed to move that prevention needle significantly and to increase um, coverage at the population level. Now let's look at values and preference for long-acting injectables. This is a review paper published by Laura, Lara Lorenzetti and colleague in the special um, edition of the GIAS um, journal. And we reviewed 62 studies and organized um, values and preference from end users along the theoretical framework of acceptability, which is a framework developed by Mandy Second in 2017. And what we found was that injections are definitely a favored delivery system and longer duration are typically preferred. However, as is depicted on this slide, there are pros and cons for injection as well. So on the minus side, highlighted in red, um, there are considerations like opportunity cost, time and cost to travel to the clinic, or the waiting time uh, before being seen at the clinic to receive the injection that were, um, you know, um, drawbacks. And on the burden side, some people do dislike needles, are pain averse, and perceive injections as invasive. However, on the plus side, shown in green, injections are familiar dosage form. They have high perceived effectiveness because um, they provide continuous protection. And users like that um, injections are discreet and easy to use since they are provider administered. We did see variation in interest and appeal of injection based on the demographic and geographical area. So what may inform choice in addition to what I already mentioned? Well, I will use examples from different studies in cisgender women that um, use a similar study design with a crossover period where different options were used followed by a choice uh, period where a preferred product was chosen. And in the TRIO placebo study, we, which we conducted in Kenya and South Africa, 
We assess preference and choice for different delivery form, tablet, swing, and injection, and did found that injections were indeed young women's preferred form. Uh, what was important is that the most preferred product shift with user experience. So you can see on the left that the most preferred ranking for the two longer acting methods, ring and injection, increased after use. That's in blue and pink. Whereas for daily tablets, the opposite happened, and that's highlighted in green. But what was important too is that overall, 50% of the women changed their mind about their most preferred product after trying them. Now, next, what we found is that um, increased familiarity of the method or the product did inform preference as well. And what you can see on the pink graph is that the acceptability rating of the ring, which was the least familiar of the three, three trio method, increased significantly after a modest exposure through an educational video at baseline. That's the middle, the middle bar. And next, following use of the ring during the crossover period, and that's the uh, purple graph. In another study and another population called, um, and the study was called You Choose, conducted in Cape Town by DTHF, uh, adolescent girls were provided contraceptives as a proxy for PrEP. And um, there again, injection was chosen by most of the girls, 48%, followed by the ring, and lastly, the daily pill. So again, longer duration is a key driver of product choice, along with familiarity and ease of use. It's important to remember that choice is not all about HIV prevention efficacy. On the left side here, you see a discrete choice experiment conducted among participants in the Quattro study in Zimbabwe and South Africa. And what it shows is that a lower efficacy product, only 50%, was preferred if it was of a longer duration, provided desired vaginal wetness, was contraceptive and not noticeable by the partner. And then when looking at um, studies with medicated products, and this is on the right, for the REACH uh, trial conducted in adolescent girls in three different African countries, uh, girls preferred the ring to oral PrEP despite its lower efficacy because of convenience, ease of use, and discreteness. So when we explored qualitatively the drivers of choice in REACH, what we found is that aside from a desire for protection, key consideration were the triability of the products during the trial and a trusted relationship with staff and counselors, which provided patient-centered counseling and adherence support. On the other hand, the provision of drug level result, which was part of this trial, was valued by the participant, but mostly served as a proof that the right product was chosen. So PrEP choice is more than about giving a product. And so it's not just what you give, but how you give it. And that is well depicted in this cartoon from Fast Prep, which is a demonstration project conducted also by DTHF in Cape Town with adolescent girls and young women. So um, here are a few considerations for choice and translatability to the real world. And I'll focus on the two middle row of this table. So um, needing to focus on increasing familiarity and decreasing uncertainty, with novel prep option, some intervention that could be assessed and considered in the real world are increase awareness via modest exposure, such as an educational video, use of testimonial by peer product ambassadors, and facilitating triability of a new option. By triability, I mean the degree to which an innovation may be experimented with in a controlled environment, such as the clinic, to enable choice um, decision. And this can be ex achieved through experiential learning with some of the um, user control method or visual tactile experience prior to choosing using props and prototypes. Prep choice is also a dynamic process and, we, and it should be frictionless. And demonstration studies could assess how to smooth that process 
through an end user journey approach in the real world. So to summarize and conclude, we can engage potential end user as co-designers so that more acceptable options are developed from the get-go. These include long-acting and ultra-long-acting, but are not limited to them. We should expand the science of informed choice to better support user navigating the choice process by applying key elements of the diffusion of innovation, um, such as testimonials and triability to decrease uncertainty about new strategy, we can amplify rollout and uptake. And finally, let's remember sex is not siloed. So to increase demand and have higher impact, we should synergize health indication. I want to thank you for your attention. And this is my acknowledgement slide. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar. My name is Peter Kim. I'm the director of the Therapeutics Research Program at the Division of AIDS at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. I'm pleased to be joined today by Dr. Diane Rausch, who is the director of the Division of AIDS Research at the National Institute of Mental Health. We'd like to talk to you today about ensuring the impact of long-acting HIV therapeutics through multi-level treatment research and our vision for future research directions. There are two major points when considering long-acting therapeutics. First, they represent a revolutionary advance in both HIV prevention and treatment. They provide an opportunity to reduce the adherence burden as well as stigma and privacy concerns of daily oral therapies. But they also present a challenge in that they must be paired with care delivery innovations to facilitate access and use. The second point is that a multidisciplinary research agenda is absolutely necessary as we generate new long-acting HIV treatment formulations to assure there are appropriate strategies that support the effective and equitable use of these novel therapeutics. New therapeutic product development must include not only innovative delivery models, but also novel strategies for clinical implementation and monitoring and concurrent advances in addressing social determinants of health and healthcare access. We have witnessed an amazing simplification of antiretroviral medication therapy. In the early days, treatment required multiple pills every day, taken at different times with or without food. As you may remember, it was very complicated and difficult for patients to adhere to. We have progressed to needing now just one or two pills a day, and now we have long-acting injectables. These are evolving to last longer than monthly and require even more sophisticated strategies for reminders and assuring timely treatment updates. Some of these new emerging advancements include such things as broadly neutralizing antibodies, extended release implants, microneedle patches, therapeutic vaccines, which may have complicated and specific regimens. The challenges, of course, include costs, access, regimen selection to assure best outcomes, and ongoing regularity of scheduling, and managing the clinical implications of long-acting pharmacokinetics, which, as you know, has implications for patient safety, as well as monitoring for resistance. So let's look at some resistance data. While the new drugs that are available are very effective, resistance still happens. This graph shows data from a report from the WHO showing rates of resistance in LMICs in 2019. As you can see, NNRTI resistance is quite high among individuals initiating ART. Though it's not shown on the graph, the same can be said for acquired resistance. So this really speaks to the importance of developing POC assays to enhance access to resistance testing in LMICs. This includes the importance of simple patient-administered point-of-contact assays that detect drug concentrations in plasma or urine to assess adherence and potential new drug resistance, and developing long-acting agents from different classes, such as capsid inhibitors and BNAPs. Now, I'd like to turn this over to Dr. Rausch to discuss the need for multi-level research to achieve the full impact of these long-acting products. Dr. Rausch? Great, thanks, Peter. 
So it's clear that we need to continue to improve the available therapeutics to expand treatment options. But these new options will require multi-level research to create effective approaches to support these new regimens. This will include ongoing monitoring for viral loads, emerging resistance, innovative care delivery models, and behavioral support within strong supportive community and structural environments. It has been well established that there are disproportionate impacts on HIV, of, of HIV on Black and Hispanic populations. Next slide, please. U.S. population data from the Kaiser Family Foundation in 2019 shows that, illustrates that we see many inequities in HIV population distribution by race and ethnicity. Blacks are 12% of the population, but make up 40% of HIV prevalence. Similar discordant numbers are seen in Hispanic populations. But these inequities are not so much attributable to people, but rather to a set of social and structural determinants that shape human behavior, healthcare delivery, and health outcomes. Certainly, healthcare and access are major impediments, as well as housing stability, social and community resources, and economic stability. There is increasing attention to these structural factors and much effort is directed towards addressing them. A major impediment to improving care, access, and better health out outcomes is stigma. Stigma has been a barrier to effective care since the beginning of the epidemic and continues to be a major issue. And while a lot of effort has been directed towards managing stigma, we still have a long way to go. Addressing intersectional stigma, stigma continues to be a high priority of research at NIH. A recent special issue in the American Journal of Public Health, sponsored by OAR and NIMH, reports on the state of the science in international stigma research. One way to address some of the access issues is to develop, to develop more supportive, innovative delivery models. They could include more community-focused walk-in clinics, or group health support centers, mobile vans, pharmacy care centers, and others. These will be extremely important to expand our care models to meet the needs of our clients. These alternative care sites must include patient-centered support for shared decision-making on regimen selection to maximize health outcomes, timely adherence to injection visits, and long-term retention and care, as well as health system and workforce constraints. And some solutions can include creating decision tools for person-centered shared decision-making on appropriate regimens, advancing appointment attendance and care and retention interventions, as well as implementation science approaches to address provider and care factors. So moving forward, in order to create the maximum impact, we must consider development of improved regimen options, as we've discussed, while simultaneously developing improved strategies to effectively monitoring, monitoring clinical outcomes and provide behavioral support to improve access to new care delivery systems and overcome some of the social and structural determinants of health that might be impacting that, those outcomes. And this fund must be done together collaboratively and cooperatively to have the highest impact and the best potential for success. So in conclusion, long-acting therapeutics represent a seminal advance in the field of HIV treatment and prevention that has the potential to significantly improve clinical outcomes for all people with HIV. But we must undertake research to translate the potential to reality. This includes advancing new drugs, ancillary diagnostics and tools for adherence monitoring and drug resistance, and behavioral and implementation research to ensure equitable access to care that will maximize the impact of these technologies. So thank you for your attention, and we'll now turn it back to the next speaker. Okay, welcome to the live panel discussion and to our panelists, our guest editors, and others who are going to be helping us to answer some of your questions today. I'm Annette Sohn, one of the co-editors-in-chief of, of the Journal of the International AIDS Society. And I first would like to introduce Dr. Beatrice Grinstein from the Oswaldo Cruz Foundation of Brazil. She's going to be opening our discussion with sharing some comments 
Uh, Dr. Grinstein is also the president-elect of the International Aid Society and was herself a co-author on one of the papers included in the supplement. So Beatrice, would you like to start us off? Yes, thank you so much. Thanks uh, very much to the IAS and the JIS editors. You and as well for the kind introduction and also for Ken for organizing this webinar featuring this critically useful supplement. Thanks as well to Drs. Moretli, Flexner, and Bauermeister, ba Bauermeister for the critical expertise in putting together this supplement. Thanks as well to the speakers for the presentations which highlighted from different angles some of the multiple challenges we need to face to bring the new long-acting technologies for prevention and treatment. Special thanks for the great testimonials that clearly show us the need for expanding our prevention and treatment options. There is robust efficacy evidence of long-acting prevention and treatment technologies, but effective implementation in long and low and middle income countries need to be achieved. On the prevention side, we have historically seen that the introduction of evidence-based technologies into public health programs has been fraught with delays that result in missed opportunities for impact. With important and profound inter-country inequities, there is a major concern that the discovery of new technologies may even widen this gap, and differences in HIV prevention and care outcomes may further exacerbate these inequities. Experiences from oral prep implementation have identified strategies to mitigate user and provider barriers, which have relevance to the introduction of new long-acting PrEP formulations, namely the darunavir ring, the, the, the tapivirin ring, and uh, uh, long-acting cabotegravir, which reduce user burden associated with oral PrEP and could improve coverage to increasing choice to allow users to identify which PrEP option best fits their needs. However, New products have costs and programmatic demands that will impact their introduction. In addition, structural factors such as poverty, stigma, and access barriers to HIV prevention disproportionately have impact vulnerable and often marginalized populations. Strategies to address these inequities need to be a focus of long-acting PrEP implementation so that access gaps to these exciting new PrEP formulations do not widen. So, more options of prevention technologies will lead to better choices, increased coverage, and higher impact. However, is choice a real option? As previously discussed, in 2022, Vive Healthcare and the MPP Medicine Patent Pool signed a voluntary licensing agreement for patents relating to CABLA for HIV PrEP to help enable access in least developed, low income, low middle income, and sub Saharan African countries. On top of this, sales of outside the licensed territory are allowed in the countries where no patents were filed. Nevertheless, generics won't reach the market for a few years, and until then, affordable pricing must be agreed upon so that this product can actually reach people immediately. With the current direct and indirect territorial coverage included in this licensing deal, there are still far too many people who stand to benefit the most from this scientific advancement uh, left behind. As well discussed by Drs. Kim and Rauch, the long-acting extended delivery HIV therapeutic regimens represent a revolutionary advance in HIV treatment. Long-acting formulations hope, hold great promise in helping to close the significant gaps with, between efficacy and effectiveness in HIV treatment by eliminating the requirements for daily pills. CAVRIL is currently part of the several treatment guidelines in high-income countries, but has not yet been incorporated in the WHO guidelines as there are important gaps in knowledge delaying this incorporation such as TB co-infection management, hepatitis B management, using pregnancy, among others. These important aspects, aspects were not properly addressed in the registration of trials, and the large majority of enrolled participants were from high-income settings. So these integrative approaches will require a multidisciplinary research agenda, as well pointed out, that will generate strategies that support the effective and equitable use of these novel therapeutics. 
in order to fully benefit from these prevention and treatment long-acting technologies, these regimens must be paired with care delivery innovations that facilitate their access and use. Advancing this, uh, the equitable impact of long-acting prevention and therapeutics will require concurrent consideration of broader social determinants of health, such as intersectional HIV stigma and discrimination that can impede favored favorable HIV prevention and treatment outcomes for those who need the most. Without further ado, let's move to our question and answer session. Obrigado, Beatriz. Thank you so much for those um, very trenchant remarks. And yeah, we have a bunch of questions uh, for the panel. Um, and be before we start, uh, Mitchell Warren, uh, who's a member of the IS Governing Council and the uh, head of um, AVAC, put some excellent resources in the chat. For those who are not following the chat uh, and who want to have more resources, please scroll down and get those resources. They're very helpful. And um, this webinar will be um, mounted, uh, the whole proceedings will be mounted on the um, uh, JIS website after this presentation. So there'll be opportunities for people to revisit some of the very rich material that was covered uh, today. Um, one clarifying question, Charlie, could you comment on the formulation? There were questions sort of like how much medication and you know what does it, what's its consistency look like uh, so to give people more of a sense of what the actual product is uh, when we're talking about long acting, at least the current generation long acting uh, medication? So the formulation of the product is dependent on the drug involved. And so cabotegravir and rilpivirine are very similar formulations. They are nanocrystals of pure drug. Uh, the crystals are of various sizes and the small crystals dissolve quickly and the large crystals dissolve slowly and the intermediate crystals dissolve at an intermediate rate. And the sum of the rates of dissolution of those different sized crystals leads to the smooth, um, long release curve for these agents that I think most of you are familiar with. Linacapavir, the other approved long-acting drug, is, is, a, um, uh, is a formulation that relies on high molecular weight polyethylene glycol for its slow release, as well as the inherent pharmac pharmacokinetic properties of the drug itself. Um, and then you have other polymer-based release formulations like that which is involved in the depivirine ring. Um, and there, when it comes to implants, which are still investigational, but are uh, approved and in widespread use for contraception, for example, those formulations are also polymers. Um, uh, the um, the uh, implantable uh, levonorgestrel uh, formulations, for example, are non-bioerodible, but there are long-acting bioerodible uh, injectable implant formulations for other diseases as well. And it's likely that that technology will eventually find its way into use for HIV. Great. Thank you so much. There are a bunch of questions about uh, cost issues. So may want to start off with Jacine, but others in the panel may want to uh, comment. Uh, one question just uh, raised the issue about the cost effectiveness uh, calculations are presuming uh, very high levels of adherence to oral medication. And in the real world, uh, we know that um, people may uh, not necessarily be uh, optimally adherent. So would it be appropriate to rethink some of those cost effectiveness uh, calculations with regard to real world um, levels of adherence uh, for oral medication when comparing an injectable comparator. Uh, and then there's the comment just about the, the price being so, so critical um, about you know, overcoming the IP and the technology issues. And there was a parallel question that um, uh, sort of asked, asked about whether uh, these cost issues are the reason why uh, relatively few countries have applied for licensure when you consider uh, the global burden of HIV. So, Jacine, do you want to hold forth on that? Yes, um, thank you very much, Ken. Um, I'm waiting for my video to be enabled. Ah, there we go. Sorry. Um, 
So thank you very much. Those are really a set of very good questions. I tried to type up some of the answers, um, mostly because uh, some of the details are very technical and I wanted to get that out of the way. But in summary, I think that what um, perhaps I omitted a little bit in my, in my talk was the fact that cost is really um, a proxy for profit as long as you have a single monopolist manufacturer, which is the situation with injectable cabotegable right now. And there you need to think about basically two factors. So either if you want to make a profit, you either make it from a single, from the price of a single commodity, um, or you make it from just having a very large market, which then allows you to reduce the, the price um, because net, because the one basically is multiplied by the other, your total profit um, stays the same from a very cheap product sold to a very many people. So that's, it's very, very simple uh, market economics there at play, which is why we're interested in um, creating a larger love ma market even in the next three years before that competition um, pressure comes online um, from the generic um, manufacturers. Um, creating a large enough market in order to allow the current manufacturer to lower the price. And that's why um, we were talking about all those factors. So basically, the factors that allow us to create a large enough market with a big enough demand um, should allow then for a lower price. Um, I do think right now the, the cost of, that is being bandied about, and you saw those ranges, so basically um, between the 40 and $45 per injection, of course, hugely more uh, less expensive than what's currently in the market um, in high income countries, but still completely unaffordable to a number of countries, including South Africa. And you've seen some of the um, coverage in the South African uh, media that Warren put online, where basically the South African government says, either you make it as cheap as oral PEP, or we won't even come to the party and start those negotiations. In our um, work, we showed, including all factors known about easier access and, and higher demand and higher um, likely duration of staying on um, PrEP when it is injected uh, instead of the oral PrEP formulation, including all of those factors that actually came from the HPTN um, or eight, um, uh, three and five trials including all of those, we still could accept a cost of injectable PEP that's twice the price of oral PEP, only that the kind of two times X um, that we could accept is limited because our X, the price of oral PEP in South Africa is exceptionally low because it is already, already generically manufactured. It's a huge market. It's two drugs we are already using to treat basically 6 million people on treatment. Um, etc. So it's really hard for an injectable to basically beat or um, come uh, low enough on that price unless we also do some market shaping um, in the shape of donors coming into the market, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, thank you. Anyone else want to comment on these um, cost issues, which are definitely challenging? Yeah, okay. sure. And I'll, I'll I'll say a couple of words. Um, we've published some articles on um, pathways to cost-effective production of long-acting formulations in a generic marketplace. Um, I will state that it is exponentially more complicated than providing oral drugs in a generic marketplace, and it requires manufacturers to develop, in many cases, brand new product lines that would be used to make these formulations. And the generic manufacturers are reluctant to make the upfront investment in the equipment and facilities necessary to do this unless there is a guaranteed market. And so, for example, if you are a generic manufacturer, you do not want to invest millions of dollars to produce a facility for making generic cabotegravir. And then a year later or two years later, it's replaced by another long acting formulation and the market collapses. So this then becomes a very complicated negotiation with the manufacturers and also requires a little bit of ability to predict the future about where the market is going to go. So these are not simple problems to solve, but they require the input of all of the stakeholders um, not just the manufacturers and policymakers, but also prescribers and uh, the affected communities, because we're all going to have to work together 
to solve these problems. Not not easy set of issues, but I think this is going to be some of the key issues we're all going to have to pay attention to over the next few years because it really may determine whether this rollout is successful or not. Um, there was a question about do fixed facilities have a role in delivery of um, long, these long acting products? And I, I wonder if just to make that more general, um, Kenneth, uh, Ariane, and um, maybe Sinead and Beatrice, do you want to comment on what are emerging, um, you know, what are the best fits, best practices, most innovative um, models that you're seeing that um, you think will really have an impact in the scale up and delivery of, of these long acting products? So do you want to start Kenneth and then Ariane? Yes, thank you. Uh, when we think about uh, delivery models, I think the key message is that there's no one size fit all. So the, as we learned from the oral prep delivery, we started with fixed facilities, hospitals precisely, and in HIV clinics, and we were able to reach a certain demographic. What we are learning now is the more you increase other options of delivery, you are reaching demographic that is not easily reached. But that does not mean that we move away from the current standard in many countries, which is the hospitals. Because like what when we did some research in Kenya, trying to have the people who get their regular prep from a fixed hospital, and we tried to ask them whether they would translate and move to their pharmacy, we didn't see high transitions. And we are seeing the same now for people who are getting prep within pharmacies, trying to see whether they would be willing to go to hospitals. Thank you. Thanks. Ariane, any, any additional words of wisdom? Um, just a couple of uh, thoughts. Um, Kenneth is uh, more into the implementation research space than I am, but <clears throat> I think we can't forget that where you will access your um, prevention or treatment um, has an impact on perceived or uh, stigma. And um, so uh, um, when we think, as long as stigma is high, they're not, there's not just a desire for discrete methods once you've taken them and um, you know, uh, invisibility um, of the product itself, but also where you get the product from. And um, in some of the research we've done, there was a lot of anxiety about being seen going frequently to a clinic or a hospital, because that may point to the fact that you may be sick or you may have a you know a stigmatizing condition, so we have to take all that into uh, uh, consideration. Not just the cost and the distance, but um, what will be um, as seamless as possible or as invisible as possible. As long as long as we haven't tackled the issue of um, the ongoing stigma about HIV. Over. Great. Thank you. Uh, Sinead and Beatrice, do you want to come in from, from both your national perspectives? Are there uh, are there projects that have been rolled out that really show great promise for being scaled up more widely? So maybe I can comment. Um, I think I think there are a couple of models that we have. The first thing we've seen is enormous uh, success with community-based models of antiretroviral therapy in South Africa, and we've really been able to it's perhaps a not not the best term, but we've seen people no longer having to come to clinics for their medication or to come very infrequently, and clinics are then able to manage people who need care. So I think, and also what we've seen in in contraception is community-based distribution of contraception. And I think the idea, particularly as we're sort of thinking about achieving high coverage, is really to take products to where people are at, and often people are going to use long-acting products. The reason that they like the long acting products is that they have unpredictable lives. They want something that's discreet and convenient and is not, you know, kind of as easy to kind of get and forget. So I think we're going to have to go through a period of figuring out how to kind of deliver maybe more complicated agents like injections, but in non traditional settings. And what we've seen sort of as helpful are mobile delivery vans. Uh, you know, kind of uh, these peer-led services, but injections clearly are harder to do than sort of distribution of pills or rings and and kind of the addition of testing. And we're, I think you know, it's a real opportunity to explore these uh, implementation models. And certainly that's what's happening at the moment with a number of, uh, of implementation programs. I think the other thing is that there's still a value for clinics, particularly when you're thinking about integrated services, when you're trying to also kind of package 
for example, PrEP with uh, STI testing or treatment or contraception or gender affirming hormone therapy. So we, we can also think about sort of uh, delivery models where there might be efficiencies, even if there's still an ele element of clinic based. Um, so those are just some thoughts, but over to you, Beatrice. Thank you. So <clears throat> talking a bit about my region. So in Latin America, we have a few public health prep programs Brazil has the largest one, but we only have less than 70,000 people who have started PrEP. So even having a public health program, we face many challenges in scaling up PrEP in, in my country. So what has been shown in the last year is that the centralization for primary care uh, services and family care units has really improved uptake but uh, in these units, we are not that well equipped to provide this uh, more comprehensive care that clearly can be provided at more specialized clinics. So there are there is always this balance. We expand, but we offer less services in simpler services. We also expanded uh, here so that nurses and pharmacists can prescribe and follow up individuals on PrEP. And this has been also shown to be uh, really great initiatives to improve uptake. And we hope that it will improve persistence as well. <clears throat> In regards to long acting PrEP, <clears throat> we do envision challenges related to the complexity of the service that needs, uh, that needs to have in place other features than what we have for oral PrEP. For instance, we have initiated the a couple of months ago, our uh, long-acting prep cabotegravir uh, implementation study in Brazil that we will enroll 1,020, uh, 1,200 uh, 1, individuals, MSM and transgender individuals and non-binary uh, that uh, will be followed on CabLA. But overarching, the overarching design is that people who come for prep will this will be offered the choice between oral and injectable PrEP. And what we have been seeing now that we have approached uh, people uh, came to our services searching for PrEP, we, the total number we have at, uh, at this moment is around 400 individuals. And we are seeing that 75% of them are choosing uh, injectable PrEP. And this is only 18 to 30 uh, gender minorities that are part of the project. And it was completely unexpected for us that those between 18 and 24 chose le choose less injectable PrEP because of fear of injection. So we were not expecting this, but we are facing this uh, as we move forward. So very interesting points and we uh, are learning every day on how best to move forward. Thank you. Great, thank you. Annette, you wanted to um, deal with two of our uh, live questions? Yeah, sure. So uh, slightly different topic, but their question came up kind of referring back to what was said earlier about how many people who start oral prep discontinue. And in the context of long acting injectables, and recommendations for follow-up and the risk of drug resistance and support and the tail for long-acting cabotegravir, uh, the question is asking what kind of data are out there now to support recommendations around what to do around monitoring long-term for people on injectable PrEP? So this question is for, for all of our panelists and also our NIH colleagues in case you're aware of research that's ongoing that might help to inform future guidelines. Well, uh, I can just say that uh, there is a lot of interest in point of care testing for not only uh, HIV status, but also uh, uh, resistance as well as drug levels. So. I think if we had, there was recently an office based research big meeting on that to try to think about point, point of care testing. And I think that's something that uh, could help move people more into uh, you know, monitoring themselves rather than having to go to get checked out all the time. 
I don't know, Peter, if you want to add to that. I would say, you know, diagnostics and the process of diagnosis is key. We're all humans and we all like it when things are convenient for us. And sometimes when we put additional unnecessary barriers in front of people to get diagnosed or to get connected with treatment, it only, you know, makes it makes uh, life more difficult for people when probably the last thing they need is more difficulty in their lives. So I think uh, developing better diagnostics and diagnostic algorithms and um, processes, uh, community programs where we can really get diagnostics out there and get people tested and connected into um, treatment programs is probably the best way to go and something that's desperately needed for us. Thank you, Peter. Charlie, do you want to comment on the resistance risk and research? Yeah, so uh, we're all used to thinking about resistance risk in the context of long-acting cabotegravir and molpivirine used in people who are already infected. And both of those formulations have the great disadvantage of a very prolonged and slow release of drug with this um, so-called uh, pharmacokinetic tail that would allow the virus to eventually continue to replicate in the presence of low concentrations of drug. Some of the, the resistance issues are amenable to solution by novel formulations. So for example, implant formulations do not tend to have a prolonged tail. They release drug at a more or less steady rate. And once the implant is depleted of drug, then the concentrations drop from something to zero uh, rather quickly. And so that presumably would be much less likely to promote resistance in someone who's already infected. Um, I will say the strategies are gonna be different in the prevention setting as compared to the treatment setting. The treatment setting, it's obvious that we need a way to maintain constant uh, drug exposure at a level that will prevent virus replication in individuals on these formulations. And we need to be very thoughtful about uh, when and if uh, someone wants to or has to switch from one formulation to another. So some of these are issues are issues that are amenable to solution by science. And some are going to require policy solutions rather than scientific solutions. And so it's really a combination of the both that, of both that are going to be needed. Thank you. And Beatrice? Yes, thank you. So we are now running the open label extension phases, both for HBTN 083 and 084. She made me want to comment on, uh, on this as well. And this, uh, open label extension phases will provide us robust data because we are using molecular testing uh, during uh, follow-up and this will bring us robust data to inform the field. Also, uh, several implementation studies are uh, opening or about to open that will also provide more information about resistance and about the what we will use as first-line therapy for those who still convert. Very few of these some of these projects are also using molecular testing that will bring further data. Thank you. Thank you. And, and another question, and perhaps this is also going to be for Peter. Uh, in, we often talk about how we have so many tools or an increasing number of tools that there's a lot more focus on choice, as was mentioned by some of our speakers. But do we really have enough tools? Can we achieve our goals in reducing HIV burden without a highly effective and affordable HIV vaccine was one of the questions. And, and I thought that might be something you would want to comment on. Yeah, I mean, personally, I think it's theoretically possible for us to uh, bring an end to the HIV pandemic without a vaccine. And that possibility has been written about. I think it will be extremely difficult to do so. In regards to that question about tools, um, I don't think that we have all of the right tools in our toolbox yet. I think more tools are needed. I mean, we do have some important tools, but at this point, you know, sometimes we're left, you know, hammering uh, uh, when we need actually a wrench. And so I think we need additional tools. It's not that the tools that we have now are bad. We have some great tools, but we don't have all the tools need, we need uh, to get the job done. That's my personal opinion. 
Thanks. And maybe Ken, I know you've been moderating all this time, but if we could ask for you to share your reflections as well on the promise of long acting extended duration antiretrovirals. Yeah, well, I think we're entering a very exciting period of time, but but again, we have to have these caveats. I mean, I think Beatrice's data about younger um, uh, MSM and transgender people not necessarily wanting uh, injectables, uh, that actually, uh, we had similar findings in a study we did um, in the US too, that the preferred product was actually a monthly oral pill. So that's a long acting modality and there, there's a, um, a monthly pill that's now undergoing early early phase studies. So. So we have to be somewhat agnostic as scientists and clinicians about what's going to work best. And I, I think obviously if we've learned uh, from the contraceptive field that having more modalities and more choices is likely to increase the overall um, population uptake of, of any of these products. But, but I think as Jacine pointed out um, at the outset, it's very sobering. The, co the cost issues uh, and um, are really quite daunting. And I think we have to really think about that if we're going to be able to get these uh, products uh, to scale. But I, I think they're very exciting and uh, uh, we've already seen uh, uh, some rapid uptake in various settings around the world. Thank you, Ken. And we're almost at the end of our time for the webinar. So before we close, I'd like to give, give our guest editor, Sinead and Charlie, the chance to leave a few comments. Well, I'll just start. By, stay, by saying to everyone here, um, this is a work in progress. Um, we have never really had the opportunity to apply these kinds of technologies to the treatment and prevention of a chronic infection. And um, I do think it's a very exciting time. I do think we're looking at a revolution in approach to management, um, but I do think it's going to be a, a, moving, uh, uh, a moving field. It will be constantly evolving and it's going to be important to pay attention and keep yourself educated about where the field is going and uh, what the issues are. Sinead? And really to, I think, echo those comments, I, I would agree that it's an incredibly exciting time, but I think if we develop these great products and we aren't able to deliver them to the people who need them, then we haven't really met our obligations. And so, the key focus really needs to be not just on kind of expanding the range of options, but making sure that they're accessible uh, and that we can deliver them in a way that we, we can really achieve the coverage and the impact we hope so that we can sort of envisage a world where we've ended HIV. It's a perfect place to stop. Thank you all so much to our speakers, our commenters, our guest editors. And we are sorry we could not answer all of your questions. But in fact, I think some of them can be. Uh, you can learn more about them from the references that we shared in the chat and the resources as well as the supplement itself. So we will be uploading this video to the IES platform. Please feel free to let us know if you need more information about the webinar. And we want to thank again all of those involved with the supplement, supplement sponsors, and the team at the Journal of the International AIDS Society uh, and the journal for all of their help in preparing for today's webinar. Thanks, everyone.